Thank you very much, Julio, and to Kyle uh, Delaney, who must or stepped out there, um, for, for hosting me. I, it's a real pleasure to speak to you. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, my first project. It was my PhD. Am I, I feel a little echoey, but is it OK? Um, I'm going to talk to you about my first project. It was my PhD dissertation and turned it into my first book. And the title actually was Engineering the Revolution. I've changed the subtitle for you. But it will be about stuff you probably don't know. It will be uh, long ago. I'm going to go back mostly 200, 250 years in time. And a little bit far away to France, although I'll come back to the United States. So I wanted to talk about stuff actually that a little bit deliberately I thought very few of you would know much about. But you're going to recognize a lot of the concepts. And as Julio suggested uh, at the end, I really want to leave time for questions. Because I want you to think about the origins of modern engineering, which is what I'm going to talk about today, and many of the concepts that were developed at that time to think and be an engineer, so that you can think about what's changed, what's different. I mean, the advantage of history, what history does, even though we're going back far in time, is that distance allows us to think about what we take for granted. Because if, when you learn about where things came from and how long they've been around, you understand, well, if I'm still using that concept and the social world around me has changed, how, what's different about it? How am I using that kind of concept? So I'm going to really show you a kind of entire social world. And the way I'm going to do it, and this was the sort of premise of my first book, was to take a specific single artifact and see if I could use the history of its design, its manufacture, and its deployment to tell a history of the kind of thing that you know, historians like in my department in history care a lot about, which is the Enlightenment and French Revolution, the period of 18th century France. Can you use a single artifact to tell that story? So I'm going to talk today about the first artifact that was actually subject to engineering design and uh, manufacture, the first artifact that was transformed. Does anyone have a good guess as to what that artifact is? It's a hard one. What's the first? object in the world, piece of technology in the world, where scientific and technical design made a difference, a huge difference, transformed the world. Helping you a little more, yeah? What? No. No? All, all these are important, but the first one we're signing, yeah, yeah. Guns. Yeah, right? Who else is going to invest all that money, time, and effort except people who care about things like guns, right? And it's going to be a story about the state. So you have a long hairy evolution of the gun from the 17th century, that's historian shorthand notation for century, to the 21st. And over that period, guns have changed and evolved in their design. And they look kind of, in some ways, similar. But don't miss the difference between this and this. Or actually, I'm going to argue between this and this. Something radical happens in this period that utterly transforms the way engineering design takes place, the way engineers work together as a group, and how they think, the way they go about the actual process of doing, creating, designing new objects, and then the way they go about having them made to their specs. OK? So a radical thing happens in here. And the difference between this and this, what's the difference between this and this? Anyone? What do you think? I do. I put a lot of it. But what, had to, what difference does it make? So I did. I helped. This is what? Smooth bore, right? Muzzle loaded, so it's slow. You've got to jam it in and then shoot it out, right? It's artisanal production. So they made a lot of them, but they made them, in a sense, individually. With using technologies like machines of various sorts, of course, it took about two dozen different subspecialties even the artists in the world to manufacture that gun. That is a complicated piece of apparatus. And they made tens and tens of thousands of them throughout parts of Europe, in towns like Saint Etienne and Charleville and Birmingham in England and Liège in Belgium. And by the way, none in the United States of colonial America. And then this is what? This is made in the United States as a revolver. So it's rapid, you know, multiple shots. And you can shoot them, right? What else about it? It's breech loaded. Now, muzzle load, they, people knew about breech loading. That would be awesome, right? Everyone would want to load from the back. But what's the problem with breech loading is you have an explosive force about that far from your head, right? And if it's not machined and tooled right, that's going to hurt you instead of the person you're shooting at. 
So getting the technology to manufacture this with sufficient precision that breech loading works, that you contain and direct that explosive force is hard. And uh, it has a different kind of uh, mechanism for firing. It's percussion instead of flintlock, but also it's made of interchangeable part manufacturing. Every piece in it is so tooled precisely that it could be swapped out with another piece from another gun, right? Which is an expression of the precision of machine tooling. So how do you get from there to there? What happens that makes this big difference? Because the accuracy of this, the ability to kill people with it, is tremendously increased. So I'm going to start here and tell you a story about where engineers come from to get at that final story. So in the 17th century, that's the 1600s, uh, in France, Louis XIV, the absolute monarch of the country, had dynastic ambitions to conquer much of Europe. And he started huge wars across partially to claim and, and reinforce alliances connected to people to his family, and he pushes out hugely beyond France. But at the end, with an army of up to a million soldiers under arms, this is in the late 1600s. But in the end, he's sort of hurled back in defeat, strains the capacity of the nation. And what he really ends up relying on are engineers who are fortification engineers, who if you've ever been to France and visited one of these towns, any of these towns, they still exist. They're these elaborate, often, you know, in some form, star-shaped uh, fortresses that become the sort of boundaries of France to this day and define what the French call the hexagon, which has natural boundaries and also defended boundaries. And the great military engineer of his age was Vauban, who built these fortifications. After these wars, so now we're in the early 18th century, the early 1700s, there was an attempt because all the, the armaments were in disarray to start rebuilding. This is an era known as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is an era in which some of the lessons of the physics of the era of Newton come to be widely expanded. People want to use this kind of new reason to manipulate and modify and transform the world. And they, there's an engineer, an artillery engineer, a cannoneer named Valier, creates a new system of cannons for this new world that is post, uh, uh, that's after Louis XIV in this era of the Enlightenment. And he creates these massive siege cannons to defend the nation. And as you can see, they're created in moldings and then bored. And as a result, they can have this incredible embossing stuff on them. And the, the embossing on most of them reads ultima ratio regium, the last argument of the king, like the final argument. You do not want to go beyond the gun's argument. And what he also does to create this core is create the world's first schools for training engineers and scientists. So I want to remind you of how radical already a thing that might be. If it's 1700, how do you get a scientific education? You cannot. There is no place to go. There are no schools. Newton did not go to school to be a scientist, right? There are no places for education such as the one you are in here. Nowhere in the world can you get systematic training in science or engineering. The first schools in the world created for that purpose are the artillery schools created in a series of towns, often the same fortress garrison towns, where they're going to train young engineers in the world of science and technology. They're creating a new way of taking knowledge, in this case a kind of Newtonian knowledge, and teaching it to students. This is in the 1720s, 30s, and 40s. Doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. The idea that you would create a systematic education in a series of sciences and then also take people out in the field and train them. This is the origins of engineering schools. Now, the problem was, France is defeated again, <laughs> sort of a series of defeats until you'll see a great victory. And the problem was that their defensive form of warfare proved completely inadequate in the middle years of the 18th century. Um, there's a huge war that's the first, in a sense, global war. It's called the Seven Years War, which is kind of a nothingish name. In the United States, people know it as the French and Indian Wars, right? That's its local version. And in a way, it tilts and transforms the world of empire throughout the world. This is when France loses its colonies in Canada and India, and Britain becomes the predominant sort of imperial power in the world. And across the continent as well, France is defeated, mostly because Frederick the Great, 
the Prussian general, creates a new kind of Germany. It's not still the full Germany, but creates Germany as a huge power in the central part of Europe. And how does he do it? He does it with mobile warfare. He does it with really fast moving troops that for the first time, instead of doing sieges, move around and, and conquer on the field. And so the French respond. So in the second half of the 18th century, a new group of engineers sort of take over from the previous generation. That's led by the guy named Griboval, who transforms artillery for the purpose of creating mobile warfare. So these are field cannons. And they're different in several ways from the previous ones. It's, they're just easier to move around. But they're also created on this new lathe, a giant lathe that they've created. This is uh, the work of uh, Jean Moritz. And it, instead of molding a cannon and boring, turns the cannon on a lathe, which precludes the kind of embossments, right? Last argument of the king. This is kind of the naked functional gun. So the question is whose argument is. It doesn't say the king's anymore. We'll get to that later. But this creates a much more accurate uh, inner bore with less windage. That is the distance between the cannonball and, and the bore. It creates more accurate fire. They create a whole system of standardized cannon. This, these drawings, I'll show you why they're important later. But the point is, it's not just the guns he's going to change. He's going to change everything. He's going to change the way they're deployed in the field, because he wants autonomous divisions and these guns to move around quickly. And these, therefore, the, way, the role of the artillery engineer has to be changed. And artillery, these same artillery engineers trained in these schools are now also going to be given other responsibilities. One of them is going to be they are going to superintend production. They're going to go and inspect and be responsible for these guns and their accuracy, how well they're made, right? They are, these are being made by private manufacturers, private armaments, but under special monopoly for the king. So they're given us like a military contracts to this day. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but differences and similarities across time. But this is private, privately made. It's not state made, but it's now going to be inspected by the state. And they're also going to be responsible for design. That's right. So they're not they're changing the design and how they design them. They're going to change the way they supervise the making of them, and they're going to change the way they're deployed in the field. They're going to change the, the way they operate with the rest of the army. So one of the things to say about French, these artillery engineers, is that they're all, well, all engineers in this period, essentially, certainly in France, are military. There are some civil engineers, but not many. Uh, in England, there'd be a few. But engineering means military engineering, by and large, in this period. And they're all nobles. They're all from the noble class. All French military officers have to be of the noble class. You have to be born into the family and to have the right bloodline. And that's where they start to make the biggest changes. So there's several, several changes that they do. The first is they institute what was going to look to you like a familiar kind of designing principle. So in the earliest period of back, back in the 17th century, right on my first slide, the way people would have fired is using an old Aristotelian science, the science of violent motion, where objects tend towards their natural resting place. But if you fire them more violently in a particular way, the trajectory looks rather different. And that allowed them to think about different ways of firing with different kinds of conditions. But of course, that's not how cannonballs really fly, right? Aristotle doesn't have an accurate description. Whereas here, in the 17th century, and then adopted right later by the French artillerists I told you about earlier, is the new Newtonian method, Galilean Newtonian method. And this is what you still learn, right? Probably, I would hope, in high school, but then maybe more you know, in a first year um, you know, physics class here on, on rational mechanics, you know, cannonballs fly in these trajectories that are parabolic, right? That, is that correct? If you think, do, do, do cannonballs really fly in parabolic trajectories? Not really. Not in a way that matters if you want to hit something. It's all very well and good in a vacuum. But uh, in, the, in the world of actual warfare, this is terrible. Physics is terrible for helping you actually do your job. What they do need to do is invent a new way of doing ballistics that's fundamentally not physics, but fundamentally different and fundamentally engineering. So this is my first challenge to you to think, what is this new kind of engineering thinking? Basically, what it is, 
as a way of, yeah, using Newton in certain respects, using classical mechanics in certain respects to think out the parameters that matter, but then measuring those parameters in the world and doing correlations. It's thinking about relations among things. You have to pick the right things to be related and then doing empirical experiments to test in practical terms, whether at that meso level of life, not building up from fundamental principles, but at that meso level of life that you can confirm is something that actually works. So you need a new instrument like this, simple as it sounds, as a ballistics pendulum. The key variable, they realize, is the speed at, of the velocity of, uh, of uh, takeoff at the initial, right at the initial firing. So they do a, a, a new study of the interior explosive ballistics that gunpowder has. On one hand, they measure the speed of velocity uh, with this physical instrument, and then they measure distances traveled. And they create a whole new set of relationships among these, which are mathematically super hard. So because it's nonlinear, right? Wind resistance creates huge nonlinearities in in how these cannonballs fly, and depends on the, the, there's all these scalar problems too, the size of the ball, I mean, there's a huge number of problems to solve. And so Euler, one of the great, great, great mathematicians of all time, but an 18th century mathematician, Swiss, designs a, a very complicated series of ways of solving these kinds of problems. Um, you know, how do you do it? I mean, now with a the computer, they're obvious in easy ways, but believe me, this, they had to use analytical tricks, they have to do iterative things, but basically they're able to create sets of tables that allow practical gunners not to solve equations, but to use tables to figure out how to relate angle of fire to distance and all those other things when they're actually out in the field. So there's a whole new science of engineering designed not from the foundational principles up, but at that middle level, a kind of mis middle epistemology that I think you tell me, push back at the end, is characteristic of engineering thinking. And in some ways, physics is more like that than physicists tend to admit. The other thing they do is not just teach uh, students, oh, you wanted me to stay over here, right? Am I okay? You're following me around? Is there a camera? Sorry, um, I, I do move, I do definitely move. Um, they have a whole new way of instructing their students. It's called problem sets. Welcome to the real world. Welcome to the new school. And the school is designed around this new way of engineering thinking and a way of teaching it to people that's, that's quite different from the past. And it has some radical implications. And the, the biggest one is this. They start to realize they're raising the, the, the demands and needs of the kinds of students that come in for math skills and everything else. And they decide the way they're going to recruit is through mathematical testing not on the basis of bloodline, but on the basis of what we would call merit. And if you think about it, they're doing to themselves exactly what they did to the physical objects they're studying. They're testing them. They're testing them with math, right? Meritocracy, so there, there are different kinds of meritocracies in the world. I don't want to claim this is the first or only. There are obviously Chinese Mandarin testing. There are other kinds of exams going on. But in some sense, at least in Europe, this is the first modern meritocracy where people are being tested on the kinds of skills they'll need to have to do their job, and then at the other end, you know, promoted on the basis of continuing to be good at doing that stuff. So for example, promotions began to be determined by, I wouldn't call it election, I would call it selection. So everyone in academia knows exactly what I mean. It's called, also called co-optation. You're elected up from the people above you, right? Isn't that what academia is all about, right? The full professors get to vote on the associates, and the associates on the, the, the assistants, and the assistants are helping pick postdocs. You know, there's a whole, and you guys, you know where you sit, right? <laughs> Everyone understands this game. So it is, though, a system designed to be meritocratic, but it has judgment. It's not just, again, it's not just pure math skill. It's can you use, do the math to do kind of practical things with it? Can you reason with it? Can you solve problems with it? It's not mental gymnastics, you know, we, the physicists aren't in the room of that sort, or the mathematicians. It's, it's a particular way of thinking. So they create this new meritocracy, and it changes the character of the core, right? They become this new kind of person, if you like. 
and then they take it into the world. So they've designed these guns differently. They're testing, or what we would call, I suppose, today variation of parameters. They're trying to figure out with different experimentation what's going to work best using these techniques. But then they're going to have to make them, remember? That's a huge problem, and they're now responsible for that. So they need new tools to do that as well, and they create them. So go back here to Diderot's Encyclopédie, which is like the text that compiles all technical knowledge, the attempt, in the world to date at that point in the middle 18th century. It's a very, very, very famous book to people who know about such things. But it really is awesome. I actually have a, a reproduction copy and came out in like in the end in a, like over 100 volumes in beautiful plates. And the way it would illustrate technological objects is like that, which doesn't seem completely unfamiliar, right? It's a rational form of rendering based on, you know, perspectival views that date back to the Renaissance. Right? So they're already, you know, a couple hundred years old, that idea that you would use perspective to represent something rationally. And you, it breaks it down, what you would call exploded view, maybe, or something. So this is all very well and good for showing somebody what something looks like, but does it help you really make it? Yeah, no, not so well. What these guys develop, and they are all guys, it's definitely a male uh, military culture, um, is a way of representing things that allow you to make them and exactly, precisely what you want. And that is first, there's something called the descriptive geometry. I don't know if it's still taught in schools today, but it is, was part of uh, engineering education until I'd say about 30, 40 years ago. Did you have to do some? Yeah, no, it was, it was definitely around. And so it's ways of thinking about the relationship between two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects and how to do that with a degree of precision. So Gaspard Monge creates the descriptive geometry at one of these engineering schools in France. And then they decide to go with this, a version of that in a sense, which is orthogonal projection. Basically the kinds of plans that in a way architects had used, so again, it's not entirely new, but with a degree of rigor and interrelation. So when I showed you those cannons earlier and the, the light drawings in the back, I hope you can see some of the, the lighter lines here, how they've re rendered this. This is the uh, gun carriage to carry the guns, and it's made of wood, mostly, with some metal parts. They're rendering exactly, this is what we want. They're going to the primary manufacturer and say, make one of these. But can you really make one of those? What does that mean? If you're doing metal work, and you're doing it at high degrees of sort of accuracy that you want, there's a problem. Nothing is exactly anything, right? There's always a kind of, what? offness to anything in the real world. These people are trying to intervene in the world. This is not, they're not drawing this for like abstract to show to some patron. They're doing it to, to actually intervene in the production process. So they have to invent a concept of tolerance. It's the first time this is ever used because they're arguing with the, um, the guy making the guns. It's like really expensive to get it super accurate, right? It costs money to do things really, really, really precisely. So they have to, first of all, create Special devices to, um, am I bopping around too much for you? Oh, okay, no problem. The batteries don't pop. Um, so this is a thing that quantitatively measures how clear the cannon uh, interior windage is. It's an Etoile Mobile. And then this is the next step, the cannonballs. You can't see it because they have the inserts in, but this is a go-no-go gauge. Does the cannonball fit or doesn't it fit? And since, of course, it's possible to sort of slide, imagine a football, slide a football through that. And you don't want a football shape. They actually create also cylinders to test, and go and no-go cylinders. And then because you don't want to drop it through, you still drop a cannonball through, right? If it's shaped like a football, American football, obviously. You could, they turn it on the side. They have all these elaborated procedures where they're, in a sense, this idea of tolerance is sort of a negotiated creation as a kind of as the conflict between these private entrepreneurs and the state asking for the specs to be less so, they have to work it out. And tolerance, in a sense, is the outcome of that process. And then you take it to the next level, actual interchangeable part manufacturing, which is not just right, asking for the tolerances on any given piece, but in a sense making the object itself the check of how good the tolerances are. If they're interchangeable, when you swap them in or out, it'll work. Right? So those guns that are being made by the tens or even hundreds of thousands now, muskets, 
So this is a flintlock, and that's what the flintlock mechanism looks like. It's a compl relatively complicated piece of apparatus made out of metal. And to make you know, 10,000 of them accurately, artisans had done a really good job, but they had been individually fitted. No more. The idea is here's an exact plan, conform to those specs. Here are the gauges to make sure that you've conformed to them, and we're going to inspect them all. Right? Now these are all individual artisanal entrepreneurs, if you like, producers, individual they own their shops. They may have a few people working for them. They're in a very complicated division of labor that's sort of managed a bit by a guy who calls himself, quote, the entrepreneur, but he's really just the guy that buys it for the king. He's a guy that fronts money to people and then accepts the supply, and he does the assembly. The idea is to try to make this into an interchangeable parts system, and it fails. It's the eve of the French Revolution. And artisans don't want to do it for a variety of reasons. It's super expensive. And though they create machine tools, so the next step up from these gauges right, is to build it in to the machine itself. right? Rather than just have the gauge check it, in a sense, what is a machine tool? A machine tool is an automated thing that conforms the final object to what the gauge wants, right? if it works well, with different jigs. right? So they do attempt this. In the very late era of the 1780s, and it doesn't really work at that scale at that moment. But something does work. Basically, those guns that these artillerists produce and the world, the social world that they create, last into the revolution and is even decisive in the revolution. So, first of all, um, the Ecole Polytechnique. Um, no offense to others, but one of the, if not the most famous engineering school in the world, certainly the model for all that follow in the years that come, um, still exists in France um, with a lot of sort of satellite schools around it, and it's created during the French Revolution, totally modeled on those earlier schools. Because after all, what is the French Revolution? It's the end of blood nobility, and it's the claim that should be open to merit, right? Every uh, soldier has a marshal's baton in his knapsack, says this guy, Napoleon Bonaparte, who is what by training? He's an artillerist. He's an artillery engineer. He goes through these schools. He trains with Lombard. He's one of them. And that's what he does. He commands artillery. That's not his only skill. <laughs> He's got others. Otherwise, he would not have become who he did. But he is exactly of that sort, that sort of person that was created by that old world. And the thing about the artillery corps is it remains relatively loyal across the revolution. Remember, most of the officers are noble in the, other, in the other parts of the army. What happens when the French Revolution comes around? They leave. They emigrate. They go. Or their heads are cut off. Quite correct. Uh, they tend to, the numbers were more left than got their heads cut off. But yes, it was not wise to stay. And there was, yes. So the corps remains. So in a sense, there's a lesson there. Radical in their own time, but a new kind of professionalism. And that professionalism has a kind of loyalty, but it's no longer a loyalty to the person, say, of the king. You don't emboss the king's name. It's not that, in, that's not that interpersonal form of loyalty, which was so integral to how the old regime worked with patronage and clients. This is a new world of professionalism and a kind of service that's created. I mean, this meritocratic ethos is designed to produce a particular kind of way of thinking, but also, right, you're meritorious to some end for the good of the service. And that is what they're loyal to. They stay loyal to the service even though there's a radical rupture in the political world. And then, yeah, it kind of works for a while. <laughs> if you think works kills, you know, kills millions of people and devastates all of Europe. One of, the few th one of the things that's sort of interesting about this, this is a story of progress, believe it or not. And yet, I hope you don't miss the fact that you know, there are millions of dead bodies all over this story. OK? So the, 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 we'll come back to that. Meanwhile, in America, I promised we'd come back to the United States or the colonies, the colonies of the United States. So I'm back, going back a little in time, right? The revolution was, that's the 1790s. We're getting into fine decades here now. This is going back to the 1770s and 1780s. Each decade matters. Just for you guys, each decade matters. Believe me, each decade mattered to them. 
and they were very intensely episodic. A lot happened in those decades. So the Americans, when they're trying to come up with, this, you know, pushing for, you know, lower taxes against the British, it's a complicated story why the American Revolution gets started, that's not going to be the point here. But the thing that sets it off in a way is actually guns. Why are the British marching on Concord in that famous, you know, moment? It's because the local Americans, lacking the right kinds of weapons or sufficient number, have gone and ransacked British arsenals and taken all the guns over to Concord. So the British are marching out to get their guns back. Because the Americans, how are you going to have a revolution if you don't have guns and then enough to use them in the right way? So Americans do own guns, but they're the wrong sort of kind. They're not military guns of, the right, of, of much greater caliber. And so there's no manufacturing of guns in the, in the New World at all, really, except there are like maybe 100 artisans in a few towns making guns locally. Guns are bought from Europe. And of course, the British are going to start blockading. And who's going to sell to the Americans when the British say, don't do it? In fact, this guy, Vergen, is approached by a British minister to say, you know, I know the Americans are going to come to you guys for guns. Don't give it to them. And Vergen says, you know, you're right. That would be a terrible idea. Because if we gave you gu them guns, you know what we would do? We would just start arming. You know, you would give guns to the people in, say, Haiti. Or, you know, we just do ourselves out of all our colonies because the locals would all be able to revolt because they'd have guns and access to it. And the British says, okay, good, walks away. And of course, Virgin's completely lying. He's absolutely going to sell guns to the Americans because he wants vengeance for uh, the losses in the Seven Years' War. And so he gets this guy, Beaumarchais, who some of you may know is the author of Figaro, the play, not the opera, uh, to be a gun runner. That's the kind of life uh, Beaumarchais led. And they sell at exorbitantly cheap rates. I mean, basically loan them the money to buy the guns. So Benjamin Franklin especially, but Silas Dean, the, the people who were sort of ambassadors from the colonies to France, procure tens of thousands and almost more than 100,000 muskets that are decisive in the American Revolutionary War. And of course, in the end, it's actual French troops with French artillery, the Gribeauval artillery, that go over to the Americans and help defeat the British. And without French help, no way does the American Revolution succeed. And now we know there's an actual material basis for that help. It's not just moral. And after the war, the United States decides, well, it's going to do something about not having an armaments industry. And so the ambassador, a guy named Thomas Jefferson, uh, ambassador to France, hears about this method of interchangeable part manufacturing. And he writes back to a guy named Eli Whitney, some of you may have heard of, who then tries to set up a factory in the United States to do it. We're, America's going to have its own indigenous arms industry. But that's not going to be enough. Uh, you're not going to have Eli Whitney, so he doesn't succeed. You need an elaborate program to make this work. You need to first you have a place where you can test guns. And there are US armories that are created, arsenals at Harper's Ferry and Springfield. And more than that, you need to train the engineers to make that work. And that is why West Point is created. It's obviously to train military officers, but it is essentially an engineering school. It is until the creation of MIT in the 1830s, the only place for the first 40 years in the United States you could get that kind of advanced technical training. And guess what? It's an entirely French curriculum. It's all basically copped from the Ecole Polytechnique. And if you've ever been to West Point, there's a lovely view of it in 1835. But you can see it's ordnance officers and doing all that. Now, interchangeable part manufacturing, come back to that Colt revolver where I started, in the end, succeeds. Largely, it's true, in private industry, not at these arsenals, right, which are state-run with state employees. But that's where they develop the machine tools, the kinds of rifling techniques, all of that stuff is developed there in the state paid arsenals. These are like the national labs. This is like Los Alamos, OK? Then private industry, because it's in the Connecticut River Valley, near Springfield, near that armory, that a whole series of eventually machine shops grow up, and private manufacturers and people like Colt create this gun that is brought back to Europe with amazement. So I mean, it's, he establishes a Connecticut 
factory, but also one in London. The French take up the same idea again. And in the middle of the 19th century, it really takes off, the idea of interchangeable part manufacturing. And this gun, a much more powerful weapon. And of course, it, you, that's just a pistol, but you can imagine all kinds of artillery and other guns that go with it, including increasingly Gatling guns. And the Civil War is basically the, the first proof of how effective these guns are and the slaughter of the hun, you know, several hundred thousand that uh, resulted. So interchangeable part manufacturing becomes known as the American system, and it spreads across private industries from McCormick Reapers to, I thought I would throw that in, but it's true, McCormick, uh, sewing machines, bicycle, what? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That was, that was my homage. <laughs> then sewing machines, bicycles, my favorite one, uh, cars, and then CAD CAM. Now, uh, where's my clock? I think that's right there. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So I'm going to recap and then let you ask questions because that was, as Julio said, the point. So what happened in the period of the late 18th century that created what I'm calling modern engineering. What did it involve? It involved the creation of new institutions for professional training in schools in a new way, initially under the state. New forms of know-how, a new middle epistemology to guide design and test technology, right? New forms of practice, central control approach to production and deployment. And, and, and that's, that's a generalization, but I tried to show you there were actual tools they made, right? New forms of mechanical drawing that, you know, presumably are still in use today. Um, new forms of testing, engages, right, all that. And then an ethos of service, an ethos of merit instrumentalism in the service of. So here's your first question. How much of this remains central to engineering today? And how much has changed? Because there are definitely changes. I'm not suggesting that all of this apparatus ex has remained unchanged today. But it's, I, I said lots of it is the same, or lots of it remains. In asking what changes, it helps you think about, well, what are these new conditions under which these kinds of practices operate? And then there's another question behind it, and maybe, I don't know if you, is engineering conservative or revolutionary? So one way to think about these people is that they are revolutionary, right? In several senses, they become loyal to the French Revolution. Merit in the context of their social world is a revolutionary idea that you should pro promote people on that basis. Um, they radically transform their social world and try to transform the world of the artisans and the people around them. So it's a really radical thing. But it's also in some sense maybe conservative. It's in the service of a state. There's a certain sense in which they're trying to preserve things as well as transform things. So one way to think, I would argue engineering is always social engineering. Engineering, at least when you take it out of the lab and try to do it in the world, you're transforming how people interact and live. All right, we can think of lots of examples, but an argument can be made. I, mean, I, I do feel like I want you to tell me whether you think I'm right, but I'll, I'll give it as a statement and you can feel free to push back. Good engineering takes into account to some extent, the way people live and tries to transform it. So let's say physics is a description of how the world is. Engineering, I'm arguing, is a description of how the world ought to be. But in the eyes of whom, right? And there are unanticipated consequences. So option one, engineers as servants. These people, this meritocratic, revolutionary world, yeah, it was in the service of something, though, right? Service of what or whom? Or Option B, engineers is revolutionary, but overt, oh, I left out my T, sorry, overtly or in disguise? Okay, so those are your questions. Let's start with this one, though. How much remains and what has changed? All right? Thank you. Yay.